Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. It's so great to see everybody here this morning. How are you doing this morning? Good, good. Well, welcome to week four of our eight-part series we are calling Giants of Faith. And more about that in just a moment. But first, as I always like to do, I want to take a second, look into the camera and say welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Wherever you are, we're glad you could get behind your device and join us this morning. Uh, Vineyard, would you put your hands together and just welcome those who are joining us online? Yeah, we're glad you're here. You are part of our church family. Well, as I said, we're in week four, part four of our eight-part series where we've been looking at biblical characters, people of faith, giants of faith, uh, and and we've been looking at different characters. We're on week four, and uh, this week we're going to call out of the stands uh, a man named Elisha. So don't worry, I'm going to talk about who he is, but that's who we're looking at. And you have your outlines in your programs, or if you're online, you can you know, download that as well. And this will help you follow along with me. There's a couple scripture verses on there, a couple points I'm going to give you, and uh, there's some points that aren't even on there that are secret that I'm going to give you, so be ready for that. Um, And hey, this will just help you follow along. So we're going to jump right in. That first verse on your outline, the Hebrews 12 verse, it starts with the word therefore, but before I read it, I want to point out why it starts with that word. It's because it just ended chapter 11, and in chapter 11 of Hebrews, there was this, it's called, I like to call it the hall of fame of the giants of faith. There's all these different ordinary people that we see in Hebrews 11, that were just ordinary people that trusted their lives to God and saw amazing things happen. They saw miracles in their lives. So that's why they're giants of faith. So Hebrew 12 kind of comes right after that. And I, part of the reason I stopped there and wanted to point that out is because as we look at Elisha today and as we go throughout this entire series, I don't want you to just walk away going, wow, yeah, that's great that God did that for them, but uh, he, he won't do that for me. No, I, I don't want you to just be inspired take this, own it. God can do this for you too. He can act in your life today. So don't just be inspired, okay? Well, let's look at that verse. It says in Hebrews 12, chapter 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I love that thought, that we're not just running our race, but there's people watching us. These, these people of faith are not just watching us. They're in the stands. They're cheering us on. You can do it. And, you know, I, the Bible says it's not just those people of faith in the Bible, but it's your loved ones also. They've got their pom-poms. Woo, go. And they're cheering you on. Run your race. You can do it. And, and you know, that, that encourages me. I don't know if you've ever been to a professional uh, sports game before, but when you walk into those stadiums and there's just, ah, it's great. You can even hear it coming through the TV a little bit. It's encouraging to know that there's people cheering you on, and they are cheering you on to run your race and to run it well. Well, this next line in the verse says, so therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us therefore throw off everything that hinders us in our race and the sin that so easily entangles. I love this because the Bible is admitting here that it's going to be hard. It's not an easy race. It's not, the Bible's not saying, come on, get it together. No, it's a hard race. We have to actively throw off the things that hold us back from running our race. It's not like you can just, oh, it's going to be easy. No, it's going to be hard. That's what the Bible's saying here. So saying, hang in there. Let us run our race with perseverance. Hang in there. The race that's marked out for us. So in some ways, we are running with the giants. And that's kind of the idea behind this series is that, hey, they're not just cheering us on, but uh, what if we could pull those giants out of the stands, bring them down on the track with us, and hear, actually hear the encouraging words? Because they're saying encouraging words to us. So that's, that's what we've been doing. We've been pulling these giants out of the stands, and we're listening to the, the secrets they have how to run our way, race well, and not just run it well, but to win, 
to win our race, to do it well. So this week we're calling Elisha out of the stands. He's coming on down. And uh, I don't want, a lot of people when I say Elisha, they get confused with Elijah. Those are two different people. And it's okay, a lot of people get them confused. I am got them confused. <laughs> it's because they're so close together. Elijah was actually Elisha's mentor. That's why a lot of people get them confused. Elijah was a great man in himself. He was a great man for his entire life. He was one of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, he was so great, in fact, that the Bible says he didn't even taste death. He actually didn't die a natural death. The Bible says he was taken in a chariot of flames up to heaven pretty sweet. (laughs) You know, there's only two people in the Old Testament that did not experience a natural death that God took them in a different way. And uh, Elijah being one of those people, you know, some would argue that he's one of the greatest Old Testament prophets. He took on uh, the prophets of Baal, uh, Jezebel, Ahab. He did a lot. He's a mighty guy. Uh, The Bible records him performing 14 miracles. That's a lot, 14 miracles. And he's even so great that he shows up in the New Testament as well. We see him uh, when Jesus is transfigured. That's just a fancy Bible way of saying Jesus showed up in his glorified body uh, to a few of the disciples. When he showed up, he was there with Elijah and Moses. So Elijah is pretty important if he's in that scene. We also see him in the book of Revelations. Uh, in the last days, in the, in the time of tribulation, uh, the Bible says that two people will come from heaven. And uh, the Bible calls them two witnesses. And most people believe that it's going to be Elijah and Moses. Now, it doesn't say their names outright, but it's, it's pretty clear that it's going to be those two people. So Elijah is pretty important. So you're probably thinking to yourself, well, why aren't we calling him out of the stands? Why are we calling Elisha out of the stands? Well, that's because Elisha is actually somebody most of us can probably relate to, re- relate to a little bit more. See, Elisha was also a great man, but for, the Bible says for the majority of his life, uh, he was not doing great things. He was, the Bible actually says for the majority of his life, he was a farmer. He uh, would plow fields. That was his job. He was, he was a farmer that would just get behind oxen and plow fields. And if you really think about it, if you really think about it, his job Monday to Saturday, 9 to 5, 8, 10, 12 hours a day was behind a plow, pushing the plow. And, and what was right in front of him, his vantage point, the rear end of two oxen. So that's, that's some of you are saying, hey, that's my job right there. <laughs> Come on. He would be pushing the oxen. He wouldn't just stare at that all day long. He would get the residue thereof, if you know what I'm talking about. It was right there in front of you. Can can I hear an amen? That's my job. Tomorrow I got to be there. (laughs) Well, hey, maybe it's hard for you to imagine. I actually brought a picture we have for you. I want you to see what it looked like from him. That's his vantage point right there. 12 hours a day, pushing that plow and getting the residue thereof. Smelly. It's just, that was his job. You know, Elijah, if we pulled him out of the stands and you said, was that your greatness? He'd he'd probably be like, no, I didn't didn't know I was called for greatness. That's what I was doing. That was my job. I was a farmer. You know, and so Elisha, for most of his life, he was in this place where uh, he was dealing with this question uh, that most of us hate. And that's the question of uh, when. It's waiting. God, when am I going to do something? When, God? Is my life ever going to count, God? I'm just waiting. I'm doing this. I'm just punching a clock and getting the residue on my hands. God, what is going on? I'm waiting. So a lot of us can relate to that. So that's why we're looking at Elijah, and that's why we want to look at this character. So for years and years, Elijah was just plowing. And as I said, you saw that picture. And uh, we want to jump down the track, though. I want to give you kind of the end as we work through it. At the end, Elijah ends up performing 28 miracles. Twice his mentor, the guy he looked up to, Elijah, twice that. But he didn't know that when he was pushing those cows. He didn't know that. And I say this because most of us view ourselves as the cow pushers. And hey, I, I want to pass you for a moment. Look at me in the eyes. That's important. You can't define yourself by that. It's important. You know, a lot of us see us as that's us. Hey, I'm just there nine to five. I punch my clock. What I do doesn't count. What I do doesn't matter. That's me. No, you're looking at yourselves the wrong way. God's called you to greatness. That's what Elisha would say. If we could bring him out of the stands, God's called you to greatness. He really has. And it's important to never forget that. So it does beg the question, though, how do we get from the cow pusher, the oxen, behind the oxen, to this greatness that Elisha is talking about? Well, I want to give you his secret. His secret, he would say to us, is uh, for when you wonder if your life counts, whatever you're doing, give your best wherever God puts you. And that's your point on your outline, is give your best wherever God puts you. 
wherever you are, give your best, whether that's behind oxen, whether that's doing something monotonous or mundane, something that's not so fun, something that seems small is maybe smelly. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't enjoy doing it. Hey, give your best, though. And this is why. Because God's watching. God's watching. When you think nobody's watching, God's watching. And you've got to remember that. He's watching. And that's why we're pulling these giants out of the stands. It's because they're really giving us words of encouragement, but they're also telling us how God works. And this is important because if you don't understand how God works, you will never get along with God. You've got to understand how God works. He's watching you. He's watching you. You know, and it's important, like Elisha would say, he's watching you before you become great. Why? Because he's watching your potential to be great. You know, a lot of times we'll quote, people will quote that verse, hey, God will give you, never give you more than you can handle. And yes, that verse does talk about temptations and things that lead us astray. But, he, you know, God is also, he'll never give you more greatness than you can handle. Why would he give you more than you can handle? So it's important to give your best wherever you are. He's watching and never forget that. So I want to give you three areas out of Elisha's life where, we, where he gave his best and where we are to give our best. So if you're taking notes, here's your first one. The first one is wherever you are, give your best in obscurity because God will reward it. God will reward it. Do you know what obscurity means? That means when you think nobody is watching, not even God. You're just in that place where nobody sees you and nobody knows you're there. Well, I want to look at his story. Uh, we're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. So Elijah, remember, not Elisha, <laughs> Elijah, the mentor, went and found Elisha. Now, this is actually the first time they met. Elisha admired this guy, but from afar. And all of a sudden, he shows up on the scene. Well, Elisha was plowing his field, and there were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. And I gave you a picture a moment ago of what that looked like. So Elijah went over to him, and he threw his cloak. Now, in those days, this was a sign of, hey, I'm throwing my cloak on you. That means come work for me. Come apprentice with me. Come sign this contract. You're with me. We're doing this. So he threw his cloak on him, and it was like a covering. So he threw his cloak across his shoulders, but check this out. So he threw his cloak on his shoulders, but then he just walked away. That's how that verse ends. He walked away. And the Bible says for 10 years, nothing happened. It's a long time. 10 years. You know, when I think about this, I know, I know a lot of people feel this way. Hey, I know God's called me to do something, but I'm waiting. When is it actually going to happen? I know deep down God's, he has something for me to do, but I, I don't think it's happened yet. You know, I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting on God. You know, a lot of you don't know uh, this, you know, this part of the vineyard story, but, uh, and I've been around for quite some time. I've been a part of vineyard for quite some time. And back in the beginning, we actually didn't meet in this building. We actually started, the church started in Pastor Andy and Sharon's home in their basement. And uh, it, was, it was a small little thing. We would, I remember them setting up chairs, metal chairs, just all throughout the house. You know, the coffee team was Pastor Sharon. She'd bring out all her coffee mugs and put them out, you know, and spend hours cleaning the coffee pots. You know, the worship was the acoustic guitar Pastor Andy owned and people clapping their hands. <laughs> that was it. That was it. And we'd do that every Sunday. And then we went to an elementary school. Uh, we were in Bayside Middle School for a year. Then we went to um, Pembroke Elementary School. And we, I remember getting up at 5 a.m. every Sunday with Pastor Andy. And we'd go and we'd just spend hours setting up. You know, the chairs are all here now. But when we were in that school, we were a portable church. So we had to set up every weekend. Talk about persevering through obscurity. That, that's what it felt like. And I remember a lot during that time, you know, going. I, I remember watching Pastor Andy and Sharon just, it felt like they were sacrificing a lot. And I felt like we weren't getting the return we deserved. You know, and I remember talking to Pastor Sharon, seriously though, I remember talking to Pastor Sharon and saying, what, what, why are we doing this if we're not, we're not seeing the fruits of our labor like I think we should? And, and Pastor Sharon would tell me over and over again, hey, I do it because I know God's watching me. This is what God's called me to do, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Samuel, my reward is in heaven. It's not here, it's in heaven. You know, I remember her saying that to me the first time. I was like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> that does not make sense to me. But she would, hey, she was consistent. I would ask her a lot, and she would keep repeating that over and over again. And I had to, there was a point in my life where I had to wrestle with that myself. I had to have an attitude change. Hey, if I've been called to plow this, I'm going to plow it the best I can. And it's crazy when God, when your attitude shifts like that, God's like, okay, your attitude's ready. And thus, the vineyard story. Um, but, you know, Elisha got this too. 
it's an attitude change. We need to see that, hey, God's called me to do this, so I'm going to do it the best I can. You know, this truth is in the New Testament uh, as well. Jesus talks about it all throughout the New Testament, but especially on the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus said, your father who sees what is done in, say it out loud with me, secret, secret will reward you. And he actually gave three examples in the same passage of uh, Matthew chapter 6. He talks about prayer. He says, hey, if, you're, uh, you know, if your gift is prayer, don't be going, hey, in Samuel's name and then Jesus' name, amen, I'm good at prayer. No, don't do that. He's saying, don't be that guy. You know, when he talks about fasting, don't go into church with your cheeks sucked in. Yeah, I'm fasting. I mean, you can tell, right? <laughs> no, he says, don't do that. Don't be that person. He talks about giving. You know, don't, when, the, when the bag comes by, Putching, get you some of that. No, he, he, don't do that. Don't be that guy. Why? Because he says, find your recognition in me. I will promote you. I reward you. Not, not other people. It's you find your purpose and your recognition in me. And that's important. That's why Jesus talks about that. And so the second thing Elisha would say is that you are to give your best in small things. And God will give you bigger things to do. See, the 28 miracles were those bigger things, but first he did the small things. And you need to know that God cares about the details. He really does. You know, I was fortunate to learn this early in life. You know, if you've ever met our uh, kids pastor, Pastor Heather, man, she is the queen of appreciation. Just being in her presence, I, I feel honored, you know. <laughs> I remember the first time my wife Olivia and I served with her. We served at some event. And then that same night when we got home, we opened the mailbox, and there was a thank you card in there, stamped and everything. I was like, what? How'd she do that? <laughs> you know, but hey, and she taught me that it's those little things that count. They really do. And, you know, I actually uh, did this. You know, we had a Mid-Atlantic conference here. We, we had a hundred some dream teamers take off vacation that week. And we hosted a conference here, had tons of our church family from our region come and visit. And uh, at the end of that week, it was almost a full week. At the end of that week, the first thing I did was I took uh, Pastor Heather's advice and I wrote thank you cards to everybody. My hand was like cramping, didn't see the purpose of it, <laughs> but, but I still did it. You know, I took the time, wrote those cards, and, you know, I sent them off. And in the back of my head, you know, I was like, you know, they're just going to read it and throw it away. That's, that's what most people do. They're just going to read it and throw Oh, that's nice. Trash. You know, they're going to throw it away. But boy, did God change my perspective on that. The next week, I had over a dozen people come up to me and just tell me how much that card meant to them. And when they opened it, it just... Wow, I was seen. I was recognized. I had one guy come up to me who I don't think he had ever smiled in his life. But this was the first time I had ever seen him smile. I said, thank you. I was like, wow. I had another woman come up to me. She was crying. And I was like, it was just a thank you card. But she's like, no, you don't know this, but I actually had a miscarriage a couple months ago. And serving with you guys, and then you recognizing me for it, reminded me that God still has a purpose for me. Mm-hmm. Boy, did God show me that day that the little things, he works through the little things. They're so important. God cares about the little things. I tell uh, young people about this all the time, and it, it freaks them out. I'm like, hey, you got to take the trash out. You got to clean your room. They're like, no, no way. God doesn't care about that. I'm like, yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. If you can't be responsible with that, he won't give you big things. You got to get that. You got to get that. And God cares about the littlest details of your life. Jesus makes this point too in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 16, he says, whoever can be trusted with, say it out loud with me, with very little can also be trusted with much. God will trust us a whole lot more. But if you can't handle the little things first, he's not going to give you more. Just plain and simple. That's how it is. Well, here's number three. And that is give your best in the natural and God will do it in the supernatural. See, I told you this one wouldn't be on your outline. It's a, it's a secret one. So I'm going to say it again, and we have it up there slowly. It's God, give your best in the natural, and God will do the supernatural. This point snuck off the outline, but it's too important to let go. It's super important. Because it shows that God plays a part with us. See, Elisha had no idea. He was just a farmer. He had no idea that if he got bold with God and actually asked God, to play a part, that God would actually answer him, that God would play. Look at this story. We're going to continue uh, just to give you kind of some context. He has lived for 10 years now. So we're fast forwarding. Elisha's, it's been those 10 years of waiting and we're in 2 Kings chapter 2. 
And Elijah is getting ready to go, and Elisha hasn't done a single miracle up to this point. Elijah has done 14. Elisha has done zip. He hasn't done any. He's washed Elijah's hands. That's about it. He hasn't done any miracles. And Elijah is getting ready to go. He's getting ready to be carried up. And in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9, he says, And so when they, that's Elijah and Elisha, had crossed, that's when they got there, Elijah and Elisha said, I'm, he said to Elisha, I'm getting ready to go to heaven. Tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken from you. Time out right there. I just want you to see that. Hey, God is looking each one of you in the eyes who feels like your life doesn't count. And he's saying, what can I do for you? He's always asking you that. You know, and too often, I fall into this too. Like, well, God, uh, thank you for this meal. Nurse it to my bodies and I pray I have a good day. Amen. No, God's asking you, what can I really do for you? Well, Elisha, he took it. He went for it. He went for it. We see, he says, okay, you're asking me? Well, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. I'll take two. <laughs> I'll take a double portion of your anointing. You did 14, I want to do 28. And look what Elijah said to him. He said, you've asked a difficult thing. And are you ready for this? The rest of the story is that God answered the prayer. But he said, in fact, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, you're going, you're going to get it. If you see this chariot of fire with your own eyes, and I'm not, I just don't disappear, you're going to get it. See, and what I love about this part of the story is that all Elisha had to do was the natural, and that was ask. You know, even people who don't know the Lord can do that. You can ask. Just ask God to do something. What's the worst he can do? No. Okay, nothing changes. But what if he does do something? It changes everything. You know, in Elisha's story, in our stories, God can change everything, like that worship song we sing. It's Jesus who changes everything. All we've got to do is call on him. All we've got to do is ask. Jesus can change everything. You know, I was so inspired when I was writing this message, I actually closed my laptop, slid it to the side, said, you know, God, I'm going to stop insulting you with the small, you know, prayer request. That's my conversation time with you. I like that. But I want to ask you for big things too. I don't want to insult you with my small mind. Let me, let me get some big things. So I got my pen and paper, and I said, okay, we have... 218 people on our dream team who, who are serving. I, I want, God, can we have 500? God, we've planted seven churches uh, since we started. God, I want to plant 20 churches. God, we have small groups in Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, and uh, Norfolk. God, I want a small group in every city in Hampton Roads. You know, I might not even be alive to see that happen. But why not ask? Why not ask? God's a big God. He's a powerful God. And he does the supernatural. All we have to do is the natural. And that's just ask. You know, Jesus talks about this too. He said in John 14, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. Really? No, actually it goes on to say, you will do even greater things. How in the world is that going to happen? How are we going to do greater things than Jesus? He did amazing things. Well, he says, ask me. Because I am going to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. How about that? <laughs> we just got to ask God. What if we started doing that with our families, with our job, with school? Just ask God, hey, God, can you help me out? I've, this is, maybe I see the small end of it, but God, can you bring the big end in? Can you help? Do something supernatural, God. I'm just asking. I think it would change a lot in our lives if people asked more often. They ask God to play with them. Hey, God, help, please. I need you. I can only do the natural. You do the supernatural. You know, so Elisha, he's come down the stands. This is what he's saying to us. He's, he's telling you, hey, you know, I was a farmer for 10 years. I never knew that uh, if I knew God, you know, I knew God was watching me in my obscure place. I knew that the small things mattered because he wouldn't give me big things until I did that. And that God, he's the one who does the supernatural change. I just got to ask. I just had to step out in faith that that would change everything. That's his story. Well, we're kind of rounding the track now. If you're hanging with my illustration, I'm just jogging. You know, and Elisha, he's come out of the stands. He's running, he's lapped me like four times. <laughs> but he's still, he's like, hey, I got to get ready to go. But here's these last few encouraging words I want to give you. So I told you to give your best in all those circumstances. But here's some encouraging words I want to give you before I go. And I want to look at these encouraging words in the context of one of my favorite stories of Elisha. He did 28 miracles. He has a lot of stories. So, but one of my favorite ones, I want to look at that story and then pull the encouraging words out of that. So I'm going to give you your first encouraging word, though, and then we're going to jump into the story. Your first encouraging word from Elisha is learn how to cultivate 
the presence of God in your life. Learn how to cultivate the presence of God in your life. Learn how to get close to God. Because when you're close to God, he will speak to you. And that hinges on your relationship with God, obviously. But it's important. You have to have that relationship. And Elisha's 28 miracles, this one is my favorite one. The context of the story is, hey, there's uh, three kings taking on one king. It's the king of Israel, the king of Judah, and the king of Edom taking on the king of Moab. They're they're saying, hey, we're going to go take this guy on. So the the story kind of goes on in their battle. And there's a point, though, in the story where those three kings run out of water. Their whole army, and that's water is important. You can only go like three days without water. But they're out of water, and things are not looking good. Animals are dying left and right. And this one guy pops up, and he says, hey, is there anybody that still knows God, that still can hear from God? Is there anybody that talks to God still? Shows you the place they were really in. Does anybody still talk to God? And somebody said, hey, there's that Elisha cat. I think he knows God. And they said, hey, go get him. So the guy runs, and he goes and gets an Eli- He goes and gets Elisha, and Elisha says, what do you need from me? And the guy's like, hey, we need water. We're starving here. We're, we're dying of dehydration. Our animals are dying. We need water. And I love how Elisha responds. Let's look at it. They come up to him. They run up to him and say, we need water. And Elisha says in 2 Kings 3.15, but now bring me a harpist. No, we need water. <laughs> Thanks for the music, but we need water. Elisha says, no, I need background music. I need worship music. What is that all about? Well, the verse goes on to say, and while the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. So what does that mean? I'll tell you what. Elisha knew that he had no hope for them unless he first got close to God, unless he first could talk to God. And he knew he needed worship to do that. He needed worship to come into the presence of God. And this, this whole biblical truth is way deeper than I have time to talk about. But here's what I want you to understand, that when you worship, God will speak to you. You need to understand that. When you worship, God talks to you. He listens to you. He knows your heart. And that's how we come into the presence of God. And that's what Elisha knew, that that's where it started. We can see this truth in the New Testament as well, uh, because we had similar, if you look at it, similar people who just plowed oxen. They were fishermen and they were tax collectors. And Jesus called them out and said, come come hang with me, do ministry with me. And uh, something changed in Acts chapter 4, Four, verse 13, we see, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, the disciples, and realized that they were just nobodies, or they supposed, they were unschooled and ordinary men, but there was one distinguishing feature. Look at this. It was that these men had been with Jesus. Let me tell you what will set you apart from everybody else, and that's spending time with God. Spending time with God. People see you different. You know, the Bible talks to us about being the salt and the light of the earth. Well, where do we get that from? From Jesus, from spending time with God. It's that, we're not actually the salt. It's the Jesus in us that's the salt and the light. And you don't have that unless you spend time with him. Spend time in his presence. You know, every great dream that we have that God puts inside of us only comes if we spend time with God. You know, I actually took a trip a few years ago with a buddy of mine to California. We were just uh, younger guys. I'm a young guy, but we were younger guys. And we were kind of just roughing it out there. Uh, just uh, living in different places. And he has has quite a bit of family out there, so we were living in different houses. And one of his uncles we lived with for the majority of the time was actually a pastor out there. And so we went to his church a couple times, and uh, they had a basketball ministry they did. It's a pretty big church. And so, you know, me being my five foot six self, thought, yeah, I'd be good at that. I'm good at sports. (laughs) So I was like, let's go, let's go. So we went and we played basketball and it was a lot of fun. We actually saw some pre- professional people there uh, just because of where it was located. It was very cool. But in that, even with these, you know, these big name people, they still made prayer an important part of the ministry. It was very cool. Instead of doing like pregame huddles, they would do pre-prayer huddles. So before you played, if you wanted to play, it was kind of pickup games. You couldn't play though unless you got in this pregame huddle. And hey, even non-Christians respected that. It was very cool. And so why, and while we were praying, they actually called on me. You know, <laughs> that's how they do it, calling the new guy. I showed up and say, hey, can you lead us in prayer before we play? And, uh, and while I was praying, I, I, I heard God say, bring this back. Bring this home. Bring this home. And so that's exactly what my buddy and I did. When we got back to Virginia Beach, we started it here. We actually played basketball right out on that uh, asphalt out there. It was blazing hot, but we, we had fun. And it was so cool, though. You know, I, I just wanted to play basketball with a couple of my church friends, but the people God drew in through that ministry, it was crazy. 
And this isn't like a reverse humility thing like, oh, wow, look what I did. No, it's, hey, God took my dreams further than I could ever imagine. I just let him play a part in it. I let him direct my steps. Said, hey, I'm just going to do this thing where I play basketball out front and just invite people. You're in charge of everything else. And that's exactly what happened. You know, there are actually some people in our church today still because of that. They've come to know Jesus. When I was praying, playing, I didn't, I didn't see, foresee that. God saw that, though. Hey, just let me be a part of your dream. Let me take it further. That's important. See, but where did it all begin? In the presence of God. When I was praying, when I was praying to God, he said, hey, do this. Have you thought about doing this? You know, that's where all of, you know, you saw that small group video about the wakeboarding. Uh, we have surfing groups, wakeboarding groups, all that. You know, those guys who go golfing and are terrible at it. <laughs> you know, all of that was birthed out of, though, hey, what do you have a passion for? Have you thought about including Jesus in that? It's surprising. It's, it still blows my mind how many times people go, no, I, God can be a part of that? Yeah. Bible studies are great, but let's let God be a part of so much more. Bring him into that. So that's why we have all those things. You know, Elisha knew this too. He, Elisha actually had a small group too. Uh, they, he would roam around. You know, he didn't do life alone. He did it together with people. There's actually one story where they were making soup and one of the small group members, of course, put poison in the soup. <laughs> and, you know, they actually didn't, they should have killed him. But long story short, they ended up not dying uh, because Elisha would pray over them and he was, uh, he was a mighty man. So your small group might kill you. <laughs> but it might save you. <laughs> Moral of that story. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, but it's important that to bring God into every area of our life. That's why we do small groups is, hey, we're encouraging God to be a part of our relationships too. We want him in every area of our life, not just limited to the book on my bookshelf. No, he's a part of my relationships as well. And that's very important. And Elisha recognized this. So it all begins in the presence of God, though. That's where the harp is. So staying with the story, he brought out the harpist, and Elisha would say, here's his uh, next encouraging word to us, his second one, is that dreams are fine, Samuel, but at some point, you got to wake up from that dream and do something. you got to do something. You can't just dream. Some of you are like, well, I've, I've got a big dream, what, but I don't know what to do about it. I'm waiting on God. Well, short story, he's waiting on you. <laughs> you know, he's called you to do something. You know, as we mentioned the status update, today's step two of Growth Track. All Growth Track is, is you uh, partnering with us to walk your spiritual journey. And it ends, it culminates in step four where uh, those people who go through Growth Track join the 200 other dream teamers and getting on stage, you know, playing the drums in the sound booth, serving coffee, greeting people as they come in. And, and they're not just doing it because it's fun. It is fun. But they're also making an eternal difference in people's lives. And, you know, you go, I challenge you, go up to any one of them and ask them, you know, what's so special about them being on the dream team. And they'll tell you, hey, when I went from worshiping one to worshiping one and serving one, my Christianity came alive. Something changed. You know, it was a step for me. My Christianity, it's just my relationship went to a new level. And Elisha understood this. And Jesus also talked about this uh, in, the New, in the New Testament, as well as we see in other books as well. In James 2.17, it says that faith by itself, that's your belief in God by itself, if it is not accompanied by, say it out loud with me, action. Action, good. It's dead. It's dead faith. It needs action. You know, I have people come up to me saying, my Christian life's pretty dead right now. What, what can I do to revitalize it? I say, do anything. Do something. Get in the game. Action. That's where the lifeblood of faith is. It's in action. It's in action. Which brings me to my third point. And I'm going to give you the verse first. And then I'm going to, um, well, I want to give you these. Uh, I'm going to give you the verse first. And then I'm going to give you the point. So the verse, this is 2 Kings chapter 3. Still same, same story, but this is kind of the end of the story. Uh, after he's been in the worship, been in the presence of God, and he's realized, okay, we got to do something. Uh, we got to do something. He says, for this is what the Lord says. Even though uh, you're digging, watch, here's a promise. I want you to grab some shovels and dig and make a valley full of ditches. So he says, do something. Get in the game. Give an action. And it goes on. It says, for this is what the Lord says. Even though you're digging, watch this. Here's a promise from God that you will see neither wind or rain. So he said, go valley, I don't know if you've seen a valley, it's big, <laughs> make a valley full of ditches. And they didn't have the weather app, so, oh yeah, rain's on the way, we'll go and do that. No, they didn't know that, there wasn't a single cloud in the sky. But go make a valley of ditches, and you will see neither wind nor rain. So what do you do? Praise God and keep on digging. Yet this valley 
will be filled with water and your cattle and your other animals will drink. And by the way, don't get all messed up. Why? Because this is an easy thing for the Lord. I can make it rain without a cloud in the sky is what he's saying. Just trust, trust me for the supernatural. You just do the natural. And this is important because a lot of us get discouraged in our lives when we don't see the signs, when we don't see something actually happening in our life. But hey, I want to say this is important. This is a truth in my life that just because you don't see the signs, just because you don't see rain, doesn't mean God isn't working. It's important. God is still working. Just because you don't see the rain, you don't see the clouds in the sky, doesn't mean God isn't working. He is working. You know, one of my favorite parts of the Vineyard story is actually how we came to be meeting in this building. And uh, as I said, we were in a school, but at one point of our story, we were in a cinema cafe down the road in, in the Pembroke area. Yeah, she went, she knows. <laughs> and it, it was, man, I, you, you think church can be in a movie theater? It can. It actually turns out to be a great place for a movie theater. But I remember, I was pretty young at the time, but I remember coming in and there would be the scary movie posters up from the night before. Our greeters would stand next to those. <laughs> you know, we'd have an arcade that was making all these loud noises, and our worship team would crank it up to drown that out. So if you wonder why our worship might be a little loud, that's where it started. <laughs> you know, the floors were just covered in soda, sticky, and popcorn everywhere, so kids' ministry fit in pretty well. <laughs> hey, but we did church there. We were, for all intensive purposes, a portable church. We were a mobile church, and we really needed a place of our own. And there was nothing available at that time. We didn't, our price, our budget was pretty tight, and we didn't have a building uh, that was within that range, and we just needed a place of our own. So in 2000, October of 2000, Pastor Andy, my father, and I started praying every night that we would get a building of our own, that we'd have a place of our own to meet. And we didn't, it wasn't like this building was on the market. We didn't know of any building that was in our price range. We didn't know how it was going to happen. We just, hey, we're going to we're going to do the super, we're going to do the natural. We're going to pray. We're going to ask, and we're just going to trust in you to do the supernatural. Well, one year later, exactly in October of 2001, we purchased this building, and we asked the guy who sold it to us, because it came out of the blue. It dropped out of the blue and was within our price range, and we asked him, hey, what, when did you decide to sell this building? He said, in October of 2000. And he's like, I remember it clearly because I, I just decided, you know, I needed to get rid of it. I don't know why, but we knew why. It was so cool. And we ended up moving in in January of 2002, uh, it was. And I remember walking in. This was a Jim Strada before. And, and uh, I remember walking in and looking around. I was like, how in the world is this going to be a church? You know? But hey, that's, it's cool because don't dis get discouraged when the signs don't match with what God has given you. Because it turns out, even though I didn't know what a Jim Strada was, it makes a pretty good church, doesn't it? <laughs> Those racquetball rooms? Those ki they make pretty good kid rooms. I tell you what, those big windows. <laughs> hey, just trust in God. You trust in God. Which brings me to my last encouraging word that Elijah would tell us is that don't base your life on the seen, but the unseen. The things that God has spoken to you. Why? Well, that's because we walk by faith and not by sight. Would you bow your heads with me? Yes, Father, come Holy Spirit. You know, God's dealing with some people right now. So let's be still and let his kind of presence watch over us. Yes, come Holy Spirit. Lord, I just pray for every person in this room right now that this uh, beautiful and amazing congregation that you've given us to watch over, you've entrusted us to pastor. I just pray you remind them that their life does count. Don't let them buy into the enemy's lie that their life doesn't count, that what they do doesn't matter. That's a lie. That's a lie. Each one of us has been called to greatness. You've given us a purpose. You've given us a meaning. And we find that in you. Yes, Father, I pray. I just pray, I fan everybody's dreams and passions in here, Lord, that you, you've given them. Let, remind them to invite you to be a part of that. Don't let them put it on the shelf. We invite you to be a part of that. Ignite those dreams, ignite those passions. Give us the action steps. We'll walk it out. Nice, Father. 
you know, God's knocking on your heart. For some of you, you feel this thing in your chest. God's, that God, that's God. He's stirring you right now. He's saying, hey, come to me. Trust me. You know, some of you might even be Christian and God's saying, come back to me. God's knocking on your heart. Why is that so important? Because it all begins with God. That's why he's knocking. He's like, hey, it starts with me, a relationship with me. I describe my faith with Christ as one word, and that's surrender. And that's because my relationship, I've just given him everything. I've given him my life, given him everything. I surrender to him. That's what God's saying is, come to me, give it to me, the good and the bad, give it all to me. All right, Father, for those who might be Christians, the truth is, you know, you've taken control of your life back over. I'm in control. God's saying, hey, come on back. Give me the controls, give them back and see what I can do. God's knocking on your heart. You might feel that guilt and the shame from the past. Well, that's because we were looking at the Bible, and the Bible says that the word uh, cuts like a sword down to the bone. That's the Holy Spirit. He's cutting in your heart. Let me be a part of it. Surrender it to me. And if if that's you, if God's knocking on your heart, I want you to respond. He wants you to respond to him. And I'm not going to make you stand up or run down front. No, I want to pray with you right there in your seat. I want to pray with you right there. If you're like, Samuel, that, that's me. That's, I want to pray that prayer. Would you just slip your hand up right now? That's Father. Praise God. Praise God. God's watching. We take a step. We're bold in Christ. That's Father. Praise God. Yeah, I see that. Well, you can put your hands down. And would you just pray with me? Say, Jesus, thank you. Forgive me for being in control of my life. I surrender it to you. Everything. I give you the controls. And I trust in you. I love you, Jesus. In your name I pray. And and Father, I just pray for everybody who prayed that prayer. I pray that you seal it on their hearts. That this day their relationship with you will be forever changed. That they are growing in you each and every day. That they learn to trust in you. And cling to you when it gets hard. Yes, Father, I hear that. When they cling to you, you are a rock we hold on to. A rock in the wilderness. You're an eternal source of water. Yes, Father, I seal those prayers. And for your honor and your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.